In the waning days of December 1956, the heart of winter settled upon the land like a shroud, yet within the cozy confines of Graceland, the warmth of the holidays was in full bloom. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, whose very name stirred passions and set hearts aflutter, was not just a musical sensation but a cultural phenomenon. His every move was watched with bated breath, his every word dissected for meaning. It was in this climate that the young and impressionable Linda Johnson, a mere eleven springs under her belt, found herself captivated by the magnetic pull of Elvis's music. Love Me Tender, his silver screen debut, had reigned supreme in Minneapolis theaters for three weeks, and the city was abuzz with the Elvis fever. With childlike innocence and a heart full of adoration, Linda penned a letter to her state's governor, O. A. Freeman, with a simple yet loaded question. I would like to have your personal opinion of Elvis Presley, she wrote. I love him. The governor, a man of many responsibilities and a recent victor in his re-election campaign, was not immune to the Elvis craze that had swept the nation. Yet, when it came to expressing his personal thoughts on the matter, he chose his words with care, for he knew that in the tempestuous world of Elvis Presley, one's opinion could make or break reputations. I've been so busy with my duties here in my re-election campaign, a successful one, that I had never seen Mr. Presley until recently, Governor Freeman responded in a letter that was as diplomatic as it was revealing. I have seen him since, and I must say that I think he is a fine young man with a great talent. The governor's words were a masterstroke of political acumen, straddling the fence between the conservative establishment and the youthful exuberance that Elvis embodied. His answer, printed in the Minneapolis Morning Tribune on December 11th, was a testament to the king's undeniable impact on the nation, even on those who held the highest offices. As the snow continued to fall outside Graceland's gates, Elvis was oblivious to the stir he had caused in the governor's mansion, thousands of miles away. He was too busy preparing for the holidays, a time when he would open his heart and his home to friends, family, and even the world, as he decked the halls of his beloved estate for all to see. And so, as the year drew to a close, Elvis Presley remained the center of attention, his influence spanning from the bright lights of Hollywood to the quiet homes of his most devoted fans. In Minnesota, the governor's response to a simple question from an 11-year-old girl was a microcosm of the larger Elvis phenomenon, a story of a time when rock and roll was more than just music, it was a cultural revolution. The year was 1957, and Christmas cheer was in the air, but the festive mood couldn't mask the disappointment that loomed over the entertainment world. Variety, the industry's bible, reported a somber tidings. Presley's draft will cost him 450 G. The figure, a staggering $450,000 in 1958 dollars, represented the fortune Elvis would forfeit due to his impending induction into the United States Army. Elvis, a loyal son of the South, dutifully reported to the Memphis Draft Board on December 20, 1957, to collect his draft notice. He requested, and was granted, a 60-day reprieve to finish his work on Paramount's King Creole, but the clock was ticking on his days as a civilian. By March 24, 1958, the King had donned the uniform of his country, and the world of entertainment mourned the loss of its brightest star. What could have been, had the Army not claimed Elvis's talents for the better part of 1958, was a roster of events that would have left fans breathless and the industry buzzing. Instead, the stages that could have echoed with his unique blend of rockabilly and rhythm and blues fell silent, and the silver screen that could have showcased his matinee idol looks went dark. The King's absence was felt not just in the entertainment industry but in the hearts of his fans, who, like the young girl writing to Governor Freeman, felt a personal connection to the man with the curled lip and the gyrating hips. To them, political infighting was no match for the fury of a Presley fan whose blue suede shoes had been stepped on the symbol of their beloved idol's down-to-earth roots and unyielding spirit. As the world prepared to bid farewell to 1958, it also marked the end of an era, an era when Elvis Presley reigned supreme, and the future seemed limitless. The king would return from his service, but the Elvis of 1958, the one who could have dazzled and delighted, was a dream deferred, a promise unfulfilled. And so, as the new year dawned, 
the world of entertainment mourned the loss of Elvis Presley's 1958, a year that could have been the pinnacle of his reign, but instead became a footnote in the annals of rock and roll history. The king may have been gone, but his music and his memory lived on, a testament to the enduring legacy of a true American original. Elvis was a man of many talents, a veritable jack of all trades, with a charm that could light up the night sky like a string of firecrackers on the 4th of July. He could sing like an angel and dance like a devil, and the young ladies of the land swooned at his very mention. His hips had the power to sway nations, and his smile could melt the coldest of hearts. Elvis was not just a man of pleasure, he was a man of principle as well. When the call of duty came, when the land he loved beckoned him to serve, Elvis did not hesitate. He laid down his microphone and picked up his rifle, ready to defend the red, white, and blue with the same passion he brought to his music. The studio bosses were in an uproar, for Elvis was a cash cow, a box office sensation whose name alone could fill the seats of the grandest theaters. They had contracts in hand, promises of silver and gold, but Elvis was not to be deterred. He had a date with Destiny, a date with Uncle Sam, and he would not be late. The town of Memphis, Tennessee, was in mourning as its most famous son departed for the army. The streets were lined with tearful fans, their hearts heavy with the weight of his absence. But Elvis had a message for them all, a message of service and sacrifice, of giving back to the country that had given him so much. I don't know what all the fuss is about, he said with that trademark grin. I'm just a guy who makes music, no different from anybody else. This country has given to me, and now I'm ready to return a little. It's the only adult way to look at it. And so, Elvis Presley marched off to war, leaving behind a legacy of music and a nation in awe of his courage and conviction. His draft call cost him dearly and lost concerts and record sales, but it gained him something far more precious, the respect and admiration of a grateful nation. For in a time when heroes were few and far between, Elvis Presley stood tall, a shining example of what it means to be an American. His was a story of loyalty and love, a tale as timeless as the music he left behind. And as the years have passed, his memory has only grown stronger, a testament to the enduring legacy of the king who gave so much, even when the spotlight was dimmed. So let us raise our glasses to Elvis Presley, a man of many faces and one true heart, a legend in life and an icon in death, forever etched in the annals of American history as the king who answered the call of duty with grace and dignity. What was the name of Elvis Presley's first movie? Love Me Tender. Which event occurred on December 11th, 1956? Elvis's movie Love Me Tender was in its third week in which governor answered a question about Elvis Presley in 1956. Oh, hey, Freeman. What was the reason for canceling Elvis's entertainment commitments for 1958? Military service. Which studio was Elvis contracted to do a movie for in 1958? Twentieth Century Fox. How much was Elvis set to receive for his movie with 20th Century Fox? Zero, 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 zero. What was the title of the biopic Elvis was supposed to do for MGM? Hank Williams' story. What did Elvis receive on December 21, 1957? Draft notice. What did Elvis say about returning to the country? He's ready to give back. What did Elvis consider himself to be?
just a guy who makes music.